uh, I'm going to just ease in here and teach the lesson I got planned. <laughs> oh, my goodness, I didn't know it was that exciting. Uh, but it's, uh, it's, it's good to be here. And it's kind of different being in a place where you work and preaching at the same time. It's in the house. It's in the house. It's good to be here. It's all work. Yeah, it is, ain't it? And so it's good to be here, and I'm, I'm so reminded <clears throat> that wherever we are, uh, we are uh, the Church of Christ. Right. Isn't that the truth? Right. And uh, no matter where we go, we're the Church of Christ. We are His body, and I'm so glad to be a part of it. It's good to have you all here uh, this this evening on uh, this beautiful day in Seattle. They're so rare, uh, but it's good to see you all back. I'm not going to keep you long, but I'm going to keep you. All right. <laughs> uh, I, I got a lot planned here, and uh, I know I won't get through all of it, but I'm going to get through uh, the bulk of it. And I just want to uh, call your attention uh, to uh, several scriptures, and then we'll focus in on uh, some that I want to focus on. Uh, but when, when you think about uh, uh, this, this sermon, I, I want you to keep in mind this whole idea of the rescue. You ever hear of the uh, group a cappella? Mm-hmm. Uh, they had a they had a song called uh, Rescue. You came to my rescue, and I was listening to that song, and I thought about this uh, with this scripture, and it certainly is, is a fitting. Let's read through it one more time, and then we're going to get into this lesson. Uh, Colossians one nine through fourteen. I want to thank uh, Paul for reading and putting the emphasis where I think it belongs. He says, "For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you." And to desire that ye might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. That ye might walk worthy of the Lord and to all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. Strengthened with all might according to his glorious power unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness giving thanks unto the Father, which has made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness, and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Uh, When I think about this letter that Paul writes to uh, the Colossians, he has some things in mind. He is writing to a church that has a little bit of trouble, even though he prays and he's thanking God without ceasing uh, for what they're doing, what they've done. But there's some things that he needs to address, and he takes care to address those. I want you to look and call your attention uh, to uh, verse 9 here, 9 through 11. And and Paul says this, he says, uh, praying for the saints, and I want you to keep that in mind. As Christians, we ought to be praying for one another. We ought to be praying fervently for one another. But there's some areas that we still need to focus our prayers on, as Paul does here. There are some areas that we need to shore up as God's people. And so Paul is saying that we ought to give thanks. That's the first thing we ought to do. Sometimes we pray about people, but we ought to begin to pray for people and give thanks for the saints that God has redeemed, of which we stand in that number. Paul prays this, and I just want to pull some of these points out. He says, I pray first that you be filled with knowledge. And this knowledge isn't just any kind of knowledge. It's a precise knowledge about who God is, what he wants, what he expects, who he is, how he behaves, how he expects us to behave. We need to be filled with that knowledge about the ethical and the divine. And we need to understand what his will is for our life. 
I know a lot of times we ask that question. I, I just don't know what the will of God is for my life. His will is that we come to understand who He is. His will is that we pray. His will is that we love one another. His will is that we glorify Him in every good thing. That's His will. And I could go on about what we know is the will of God for our lives. When we think about why we were created or recreated in this regeneration, we got to understand what God's purpose is for our life. And so Paul is saying that's what he prays for the Colossians, that they might know his will and desire in all spiritual wisdom. That this wisdom of this intelligence <clears throat> is, is broad, uh, that, that we too might be filled with that wisdom and that we might be filled with this understanding. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's important to understand and, and see what, what Paul is getting to here when he talks about this wisdom and this understanding. He's looking at the insight of getting to know who God is. Right. It, it's understanding what he wants. Psalms 119.34, the psalmist writes, he says, Give me understanding and I shall keep thy law. Yea, I shall observe it with my whole heart. In order to know what God wants, in order to please God, we have to know what He wants. In Proverbs 2 and verse 5, the writer says, For the Lord giveth wisdom. Out of His mouth cometh knowledge and understanding. And so in order to understand God, we've got to be in tune with what He's saying. In order to understand what He's saying, we've got to read His Word. And then we have to rightly divide that Word to get to the precise understanding of what God wants us to do. It doesn't come by happenstance. We've got to read it. And, and regardless of what people say, it doesn't come through osmosis either. You can't lay your head on a pillow and get back up and understand what God wants you to do. You've got to read His Word, study His Word, and then rightly divide the Word. We ought not be afraid to talk to one another about what our thoughts are about the Word of God. And when someone comes to us about what they're thinking about the Word of God, don't put them down for not knowing, but help them understand it better. Challenge them in their thinking. Help them grow to understand what God wants. Yes. Oh, yeah. So that we all can grow to a knowledge of who God is and what He desires for our lives. Mm -hmm. Proverbs 4, 7. I was talking to an older brother who uh, kept quoting this one uh, some time ago, about a year ago. And he, uh, he says, Proverbs 4, 7, And it's wisdom is the principal thing. Yeah, yeah. Therefore, get wisdom. And with all that getting, get an understanding. And this understanding is just not random understanding about how the world works. That's good. That's the will. We need that. But this understanding is about what God wants. It's about who He is, what God desires, how He desires us to be as His people. And when we get that understanding, then we can survive and thrive. Turn to Hosea 4. 6 and 7, a, a verse that we're familiar with. And uh, again, as Paul is writing to the Colossians, and he's putting all these things in order, in terms of getting wisdom, getting understanding, he's helping us also to understand that there's some things that we need as well. And so, God speaking <clears throat> to Hosea, he says, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because thou hast rejected knowledge, I also will reject thee. And thou shalt be no priest to me, seeing thou hast forgotten the law of thy God. I will also forget thy children, as they were increased, as they sinned against me. Therefore will I change their glory into shame. He says the people perish for lack of knowledge. Yeah. Yeah. And it's not just general knowledge. We can know a lot of stuff. Yeah. But if we don't know what God requires, if we don't know what God wants, we are going to be lost. Yeah. And for those of us who know what God wants, it's incumbent upon us to share that with other people so that they too can be saved. Yeah. All right. All right. It's important. To understand that in getting this knowledge, it helps us to walk worthy of the calling with where we have been called. 
if we don't understand what God wants, it's hard to walk worthy. All right, all right. I can make up my rules as I go along. Uh-huh. I can say what uh, it, this may be right for you, uh-huh. but it's not right for me. Uh-huh. <clears throat> and when saints, when we fall into that trap of saying, well, this may be right for you, but it may not be right for me. As children of God, we're to walk by the same rule. We're to walk by the same standard. And in order to do that, we've got to know and understand what it is God wants from us. There's no other way to do it. In order to walk worthy of the Lord, to make progress in the Lord, we've got to understand what He wants. We've got to understand what He wants. In order to understand what He wants, we've got to consider it. We've got to think about it. We've got to read it. We've got to think about it. And then we've got to put it into practice. And the more we put something into practice the right way, the easier it becomes. We can put a lot of things into practice, but if they're wrong, they're just done wrong. And we're in the same position that we were in, maybe even worse. So we have a challenge in the 21st century. We have a challenge in the 21st century. Amen. That we don't fall into the same trap. <clears throat> As Isaiah was prophesying to the people of God in Isaiah chapter 55, we want to make sure that that as God's people, we don't fall into this trap. Uh, uh, Isaiah writes, you're familiar with this one. Isaiah 55, in, in verse number 6, he says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. In verse 5, he's asking for the wicked to change their ways. I want you to catch that and put that together. If we don't understand and understand and get a knowledge of what God wants, we can't have the mind of Christ. And His ways and His thoughts will always be higher than ours because we can't attain to what it is He wants because we don't know what He wants. And so then there's this great divide between what God wants and where we are. And so when you think about Isaiah 55, my ways are not your ways, my thoughts are not your thoughts, God is saying they should be if you're my people. When Paul says have the mind mind of Christ, he's saying your thoughts ought to be what mine are. He says I called you to be holy, for I am holy. He's saying be the same as me. Be like me. And then he sends Jesus down and gives us an example of what that sameness looks like. So then, in the 21st century, we're without excuse of not knowing what God wants. It may just be we may not want to do it. And then, that's the rub, isn't it? Sometimes we just get into our, our ways. As one, uh, one sister used to tell me, you think you all grown. You start getting a whiff of yourself thinking you manly man and then you forget about who God is Paul writes to the Colossians and tells them to walk worthy of the calling where they've been called to walk worthy of the manner of the Lord and that manner is to walk holy and then he goes on and he says And he's praying that they be strengthened with all power according to his glorious might. That they might be steadfast. Mm -hmm. That they might have patience. That they might be long-suffering. We might know it as stick it and stay. Mm -hmm. Stay put. Stick it out. And sometimes we forget that. Uh And we want to give up at the drop of a hat when things get going rough. We just want to give up. But he's saying, you need to stick it out. You need to stay steadfast. And you need to rejoice. I want you to look at verse 12 in Colossians. Paul is asking for these things for the Colossians so that they could grow. So that they could walk worthy. In verse 12. He says, giving thanks unto the Father, which has made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. You, you see, I, I was saying this this morning in class, that, that oftentimes 
we want to take credit for what it is God has done. And, and, and no matter how good you think you might be, no matter how righteous you think you might be, no matter how much you think you can do for the Lord, it's God that makes you qualified. It's God that makes you fit. It's God that declares you righteous. It's God who declares you sanctified. It's God who justifies you. Then where is the boasting? There can be none. For it is God's work. We are His workmanship. We are called by His grace. We are called by His mercy. And then here, he says that we are partakers in the heritage of the saints, the heritage of light. I like that. Anytime you can refer to yourself as a saint, you said a whole mouthful. And it puts you in a position that is outstanding. And it, when you can say you're a saint. Uh, because when you say you're a saint, it's because God said so first. Right. He called you that first. Amen. And so you're just repeating what he yeah. says you are. Right. And there's no point in trying to deny it. Uh -huh. You are what God says you are. Yeah. You are who God says you are. Mm -hmm. And so you are a most holy and precious thing to God. Amen. You are a saint. Consecrated for a purpose. Yes. Set apart as holy. To live for Him. To walk worthy of Him. To be a child of God is no small thing. It is everything. Because God says we are holy. You see, when God has made a decision, He's made a decision. He, he's given us this inheritance. I, I, I like the way they, they, uh, the, the writer Paul puts this together with this Hebrew imagery of the allotment for the 12 tribes of Israel. The allotment of land and their inheritance. Remember that? Yeah. And so as they're dividing up the land, there's an allotment that you get. Well, God is saying the same about you. That you have an allotment. Mm -hmm. And it's what he's decided to give us. Because he's decided. Yes. We can give praise to God, Hebrews 13, 14, and 15. We just get an image to see what God has done when we were without strength. He yes. saved us. He came to our rescue. And here's what Paul wants the Colossians to know. That when we think about where we were, mm -hmm. and then when we think about where we are in Christ Jesus, it's God who comes to our rescue. Yes. Look at verse 13. He says, He delivered us. I'm going to walk for a minute. He, he, he delivered us from the power of darkness. He pulled us out with a strong hand. That was something God did. It was nothing that we did on our own. It was God who came to our rescue. There were times I didn't even know I needed rescue. God came to my rescue. Now, I didn't even know I needed a rescue. I was having fun on the, on the, on the dance floor. I, 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 thought, I, I thought the mirror ball was the light that I should be attracted to. All right now. And, and there were some things that, that, that I used to do that I used to do that, that I thought was all right. And then somebody told me I was in the domain of darkness. You gotta be kidding. That, that's how it's supposed to be in the club. Dark. used to. Yeah. But what I'm so good glad about is I had a used to. Uh, but I understand that sometimes people still do. They in the church, but they still do what they used to. And Paul is saying, don't you understand something? You have been pulled out of the domain of darkness. There was someone who had power over you, had control over you, had you blinded so that 
you thought a mirror ball was the only light you needed. And he's saying you were in darkness. But it was God who took you and grabbed you and put you into his kingdom. Yes, he did. Yes, he did. Yes, he did. It happens in a moment where God takes you from one kingdom and puts you into another. You have been translated. I like that. You have been translated. You have been moved from one place to another. An illustration. When you wake up in the morning and you wipe the sleep out of your eyes and you sit up on the side of your bed, you've been translated. You've moved from a state of sleep to a state of waking. And it happened just like that. I know you didn't think it happened just like that because you're sleepy, you're tired, but you're aware that you're sleepy and you're tired. So it happened just like that. And so when God says you've been translated, moved from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light, it happens just like that. When he says it happens and you've been moved, you have been moved. The trouble is the transformation doesn't catch up. The translation happens just like that. But the transformation is saying, where are you going? And has to catch up with us. The transformation happens. And so is it any wonder then that we see people doing what they used to do? We see them still doing what they used to do. In those same habits, the transformation has to catch up. And how will that ever happen if they don't know what God wants? And so many get out of the pool, been translated into the kingdom. But their mind is back in Egypt. Mm. Uh, wanting the king's bread uh, wishing for something that's past uh, and God has done something miraculous uh, taking them out of the power of Satan and moved them to where he is uh, in the kingdom of life Paul has to remind the Colossians of that and we need to be reminded that we're not the same people we used to be before that baptism happened we were somewhere else yes doesn't matter how good you were. Before your faith in Christ, before that baptism happened, you were in the kingdom of darkness. Just as lost as you could be. In the kingdom of darkness, without hope in the world. In the kingdom of darkness, separated from God for all eternity. And then someone preached the gospel message to you. And told you that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Told you that He came and died for your sins. Told you that you were resurrected. He was resurrected and sits at the right hand of God. Told you that you needed to be baptized for the remission of your sins and they get washed away and then you become a new creation. They told you that. And you believed it. You had faith in Jesus Christ, went down in the water and came back up and God took you from one kingdom to the other. Amen. It's not what you did. It's what God does. Thank God for His mercy and for His sins being forgiven, forgiven, our sins being forgiven. When I think about all that God does, all that He does, man, it's enough to make you shout. But I hear you don't do that up in here. It's enough to make you shout. For joy yes, sir. eternally. Yes. Because we were lost. Yes. You know, oftentimes you see those t shirts that say uh, the property of New York City, the property of Arizona State. Uh, you had a t shirt that said the property of Satan. All right. And Jesus. Jesus. Gave you another t-shirt. <laughs> With his name printed on it, you are the property of the Lord. You have been redeemed. Look at verse 14. You have been redeemed 
by the blood of Jesus Christ. Right. You have been set free yes. by means of a ransom. Imagine that a criminal is holding somebody you care hostage. You care for a hostage. And the only way you can get them back is to pay the price. That's what God does for us through Jesus Christ. All right, we were held hostage. Here's the twisted part. It was of your own choosing. Yeah, right. Mm. Say that. Mm. It's something you willingly wanted for your life. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Right. When you think about that, and it hits home, that every choice we're making is a choice to follow God or to move further from Him. Every choice. And sometimes we imprison ourselves by what it is we really want. We've got to always make up our mind and know what it is we want. But we can't know what we want until we know what God wants. As His people, we've got to know what God wants, and then what we what God wants is what we want. Yeah. That's having the mind of Christ. That's right. I was thinking about the song, Because He Loved Me So. And today, the He became a reality for me. God loved me so. The Father. Jesus loved God so that He decided to obey and come down. How much do you love God? Enough to obey Jesus and do what He says do. That's our challenge. If we say that we love Jesus Christ, mm -hmm. it's proven in obedience. Right. But how can you obey what you don't know? Amen. Amen. How can you obey what you don't know? And then, it's for lack of knowledge, the people of God perish. Verse 14a. Not only have we been redeemed, but our sins have been forgiven. Thank God for forgiveness of sins. I know some of you didn't need it. Y'all good. But every one of us sitting in this room who have put on Christ know that we need it. Our sins to become forgiven. We needed to be set free. We needed to have liberty. We needed to be ransomed. We needed for God to decide to call us to Him to rescue us. To rescue us from something we didn't even know we needed rescue from. And sometimes being in the body, I get into trouble. I, I get mentally beside myself. I physically take on some things that I shouldn't do and I, I sometimes think who do you call on when you need to be rescued every time we fall we ought to call on Jesus and even before the fall we ought to call on Jesus uh, there's a there's a cartoon I, I like cartoons I guess they call them animated so that's a cartoon and there was this one particular cartoon uh, and, and it was called, uh, he was Mr. Wizard, Tudor Turtle. Anybody remember that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Tudor Turtle. He always wanted to be somebody else. He always wanted to be something else. Mm -hmm. And whenever he became something else and got what he wanted, he usually got in trouble. Mm -hmm. And then he'd call on Mr. Wizard mm -hmm. to get him out. And Mr. Wizard would always say, drizzle, drazzle, drizzle, drone. Time for this one to come home. And you get him out of trouble. Some of the times we think of God as being Mr. Wizard. All right, all right. That we can, we'll just go ahead and do things our way, get it our way, do what we want. And when we get into trouble, we begin to call on the Lord and to help him get us out. And when he says, you stay there a while. Oh. Then we get mad at God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But eventually he does come to our rescue. He forgives us of our sins. Yes, yes. But the consequence may remain for a while and just deal with that. Yeah. Oh and so here we are. 
thinking about people that we call on to come to our rescue. Some people call on dead relatives. Where they go to the grave and they pray for someone who is dead. Pray to someone who is dead to give them an answer. To help them in their circumstance. Some will look and pray to stone and granite and wood. Who do you go to? All right now. When the going gets rough, who do you go to for your rescue? Do you look in the mirror and say, I can do it on my own? Or do you call on somebody who you think has the resources to help you? Or do you go to God and ask for direction? Paul is reminding the Colossians that we need to appeal to God in every situation, in every circumstance. And I'm reminding us of the same thing. When things get bad and go sideways, we need to call on the Lord. The faithful are grateful. The faithful are grateful. You don't need to wish you were something else. You don't need to wish you had more money than you do, although that might be good. You don't need that. Because like Tudor Turtle, it might put you in trouble. You need to be grateful for what God has provided for you and where he has put you. It took me a while to get to that one. Just accept where God has placed you and shine and thrive where you've been put. Thank God for being God. Because there's something that he sees that we don't see. And once I figured that out, just sit down, Jeremiah. Sit down and just wait. And while you're sitting, you may as well read something. And while you're reading, get up and do some work around here anyway. This place needs to be cleaned up in some way. Get busy doing something while you wait to discover what God wants you to do. But don't. Stop complaining. Because God is in control. And if God is in control, your complaint is against God. You understand that? And so once I recognized that, then it was easy to understand the faithful, the faithful are grateful. You thrive where God has called you. When you think about what God is doing, we need to recognize it's God's work. And he's just been so great to us and merciful to us and gracious to us to let us participate in his work. All right. Be thankful. For what God is doing Amen. and has done. And so here, the message is yours. In this lesson, there's some things that Paul wants the Colossians to know. And there's some things that we need to know. We need to walk worthy. But in order to walk worthy, we got to know what it is God wants. And in order to know what God wants, we must seek out knowledge to rightly get it, to be precise about it, mm-hmm. and then put it into action. Mm-hmm. And have an attitude of gratitude. Mm-hmm. And remember the faithful, always grateful, mm-hmm. because in the end it's God who's in control. Mm-hmm. I know I, I preach the gospel about the resurrection of Jesus Christ, mm-hmm. about his coming and living a sinless life, perfect, a fragrant offering aroma to God the Father. And then he died a death on the cross for the atonement, the perfect sacrifice for the forgiveness of our sins, to redeem us back out of that sinful state of captivity. He made that possible. And what our role is then is to believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Confess that. And then Think about what you want to do. Repent. 
I, I changed my mind. I changed direction in how I've been living, how I've been thinking. Everything we think about, we can bring about. How have I been living? Is it contrary to the will and the way of God? If it's been, we need to repent. And then in faith, be baptized. Amen. And that baptism moves us out of the kingdom of darkness and into the kingdom of light. Yeah. Yeah. The message is yours. Let us stand, song of invitation. If you need to respond, do so at this time. There's a fountain.